You are listening to a free version of the Majority Report with Sam Steeter. To support the show and get another 15 minutes of daily program, go to majority.fm, please. The Majority Report with Sam Steeter. It's Thursday, January 31st, 2019. My name is Michael Brooks and I'm Michael Thursday and this is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We're broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On today's program, Lori Wallach, she's the director of Public Citizens Global Trade Watch. We're talking about Trump's NAFTA. What's in it? Where does it need to go from here, from a labor, environmental, and environmental perspective? What to ask specifically of the 2020 candidates to move to a trade regime based on solidarity and values and not corporate exploitation? She's going to be joining us. Foxconn, speaking of corporate exploitation, is reconsidering. It's Wisconsin factory after receiving billions in subsidies to go there. It looks like that's not working out too well. The European Union has figured out a alternative economic mechanism to bypass U.S. sanctions against Iran, as that hopefully will go into effect soon. The Trump administration blew up the Iran deal, which the Iranians are still actually observing. CNN, in a rebuke to Trump, showcases Mitch McConnell's urging of troop deployments, uh, troop increases in Syria and Afghanistan. Some scumbag on scumbag violence there. Of course, Mitch is wrong. We do need to draw out of both countries almost, almost, keyword almost entirely in the case of Syria, where we need to maintain solidarity with the Kurds. Venezuela continues to descend into chaos. Maduro is deploying secret police units in a crackdown as the United States threatens military action. And Guaido gets an op-ed space in the New York Times to declare himself uh, president, essentially. I look forward to my offer next. Indigenous movements and unions march against austerity in Ecuador as the sellout Lenin Moreno government continues its undoing of the leftist legacy of its predecessor. AMLO declares the war on drugs over Brazil's prosecutors who, in a vicious move against political prisoner Lula da Silva, broke Brazilian law by not allowing him to attend his brother's funeral have now acknowledged publicly for the first time what everybody else knows, which is that he's not, quote unquote, a normal prisoner, which is one way, I guess, of referring to a political prisoner. ICE ran fake colleges to target undocumented immigrants, proving that evil does really exist. And the Homeland Security chair raises the possibility of a subpoena for the Department of Homeland Security chief. Casio cortez is set, along with Edward Markey in the Senate, to unveil Green New Deal legislation. And Howard Schultz, still steaming ahead here, probably should have done this a little while ago. He deleted tweets uh, that he tweeted out of a column calling Warren faux Cahantis and Harris shrill. Interesting. If I was Howard Schultz, I would have a little bit of a timing conversation with Bill Burton and Steve Schmidt. That probably should happen a little bit ago. I mean, I know this pisses people off, but I am not above uh, Warren-based jokes around the Native American thing. Uh, That one's really lame. And Kamala Harris, Kamala Harris, who I have plenty of criticisms of, I actually would recommend... The new Woke Bros dropped today. Waz and I did a deep dive on her, uh, as well as uh, Howard Schultz and Davos. I mean, I think it's no mystery what I think for a political profile. But to hear her as shrill would be like, I, I don't even know. Like, Actually, the only comparable example, I guess I'll make it serious, would be like the type of people who would say, like, 
Barack Obama just sounds so angry. Yeah. Like, you're hearing yourself. Yeah, and like, what you're hearing from yourself is sexism when you say that. Yeah, like, how do we get the least benefit of the doubt right now that we're not just being sexist? I know. Shrill. I mean, it's just unbelievable. That just isn't... I mean, look, because sometimes, you know, frankly, like, you know, Hillary Clinton received a huge amount of sexism. But is it an accurate statement to say that she is not charismatic in the way that that word is traditionally used and understood? Yes. And some people don't like to acknowledge that reality. But like Kamala Harris shrill. Hmm. Okay. She's so emotional. She is none of these things. And actually, I think uh, when I read about the, uh, in, if you look at the New York Times piece on her prosecuting record called Kamala Harris was not a progressive prosecutor and you read about her. Uh, arguing to uphold an almost certainly false conviction. I, I I felt a lot more emotional than she did about it. That was some cold-blooded stuff. Um, her period. So anyway, <laughs> that's what Howard Schultz said. Howard Schultz said, on the one hand, you have belligerent men who talk about assaulting women and putting children in cages. And then on the other hand, Kamala Harris is on her period, which is why I need to run as an independent <laughs> An independent man with a well-balanced nervous system. All right, let's make fun of Howard Schultz some more. Um, This is going to be all fun and games unless the Democratic Party nominates Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren, potentially even Sherrod Brown. Uh, And then uh, he will continue his race and they will pump a huge amount of money uh, into a delusional oligarch campaign, which will not perform well, but could serve as a spoiler. Here he is on MSNBC, though. I mean, until that event, uh, I think we all can definitely, I mean, just keep laughing and dunking away. Here he is talking about his two favorite presidents. Uh, one favorite president, uh, his, it makes sense. His reasons for it are hilarious. And the other uh, favorite president, well, he should keep that president's name out of his mouth. Republican president in the past 50 years, best damn. I have great respect for Ronald Reagan. This came from the Ronald Reagan Library. The thing that I took away from Ronald Reagan, aside from all the wonderful things he did, that really struck me, especially compared to the current person who is despicable in in the Oval Office, Ronald Reagan never took his jacket off in the Oval Office in eight years. Why? Because of his respect and the dignity of the office. That needs to be restored. How much? Democrat, FDR. How much? Resistance MLK. That's wow. exactly right. He may have voted against my birthday and supported apartheid, but he never wasn't snazzy in the Oval Office. I heard that Nancy told him that the astrologers said that he would be cursed if he took his jacket off. But nonetheless, he did it and it was the right thing to do. Now, his other favorite besides the laughable Ronald Reagan line was FDR. And I believe it was it was FDR's uh, birthday. Was it yesterday? I think we had an FDR birthday recently. And I say what I always say about FDR, which is that we already we know and there's serious critiques to be had of the really obvious things like the internment, his appeasement of segregationists in his party, and also a critique from the left. We know all these things. And at this and it's important. And then conversely, uh I'm not gonna throw the baby out with the bathwater here. I mean, this guy <laughs> was a very successful president and there's a and did a lot of good things for a lot of people. Things that are still benefiting people today. Like in 2000, like his 1930s legacy has a more positive impact than almost anybody in modern politics in 2019. And here he is. Um, this is, this is the economic royalist speech. And uh, think of this as an indirect response to the, uh, the coffee guy. Today, Today we stand committed to the proposition that freedom is no half and half affair. If the average citizen is guaranteed equal opportunity in the polling place, he must have equal opportunity in the marketplace. Economic royalists complain that we seek to overthrow the institutions of America. What they really 
complain of is that we seek to take away their power. In other words, Howard Schultz, keep my name out of your punk mouth before I have to take my cane and slap the taste out of it. My wife will kick your ass too. Now go get us an overpriced, overfat, disgusting latte, which we will buy grudgingly so that we may use the bathroom at the airport. Yeah, Howard is just an utterly contentless person. Like, he might want to make it look like he's creating some kind of new synthesis of, like, all the greatest ideas of the past. But, like, no, you picked two pictures off of Wikipedia and you said, I like this guy and I like this guy. Like, it reminds me of uh, Capitalist Realism by Mark Fisher. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to paraphrase the end because it's kind of long here, but uh, he wrote... The power of capitalist realism derives in part from the way that capitalism subsumes and consumes all of previous history. One effect of its system of equivalence, which can assign all cultural objects, whether they're religious iconography, pornography, or das Kapital, a monetary value, flattening them all into decontextualized artifacts. Well, and that's why when uh, Hillary cited FDR as her favorite uh, um, politician and Bernie cited Winston Churchill as his favorite a foreign leader it was kind of embarrassing for everybody yeah right everybody yeah. was just like um everybody's wrong here and being really ridiculous but to paraphrase mark fisher further how about we synthesize my fist on your stupid face if i could have designed public housing programs that made it illegal for someone who grew up in one of them to open up a overpriced bean chain that exploited laborers in the developing world and those at home, I would. Don't ever mention my name again, Howard. FDR probably opened up a lot of those markets for coffee beans. That is probably true. <laughs> that is probably true. Um, Good neighbor. That is true, although uh, the illicit history that we did with Derek Davison was, and it was very practical, right? Like... Roosevelt was actually decent on anti-colonialism in some ways because the Pathan was being passed from a different world order from the British Empire to the American Empire, which is branded differently. Right. Um, if painful heartburn or acid reflux keeps you up at night, try Medcline. It's a new natural solution problem. It's a new natural solution to a problem that affects thousands of Americans. MedKline is a comfortable acid reflux pillow system for your bed that keeps you in the best sleeping position for natural relief. No more sliding down a wedge or putting blocks under your bed frame. No more dangerous medication and no more suffering. The MedKline system is available in three sizes and has a patented arm pocket so you can sleep comfortably on your side without pressure on your shoulder. The soft supportive body pillow keeps you from rolling to your back so you can get the rest you deserve if you're suffering with nighttime heartburn you have to try medcline tonight with their 100 day relief guarantee you have nothing to lose the system ships free with this special offer and comes complete with a full set of pillowcases for more information visit goodnightheartburn.com or call 1-800- 6101607 enter the code majority at checkout for fast free shipping that's goodnightheartburn.com or call 1-800-610-1607 1-800-610-1607 to learn more and try medcline today we will be right back with Lori Wallach on the majority report <laughs> Nine mad years of mirage and three long years of despair. And my friends, powerful influences try today to restore that kind of government with its doctrine that that government is best, which is most indifferent to mankind. For nearly four years now, you have had an administration 
which instead of pulling its bump, has rolled up its sleeve. And I can assure you that we will keep our sleeves rolled up. We have to struggle with the old enemies of peace, business and financial monopoly, speculation, reckless banking, class antagonism, sectionalism, war profiteering. They had begun to consider the government of the United States as a mere appendage to their own affairs. And we know now that government by organized money is just as dangerous as government by organized mob. Never before in all our history have these forces been so united against Welcome back to the Majority Report. Michael Brooks here. Joining us now is Lori Wallach. She's the director of Public Citizens Global Trade Watch and a 25-year veteran of congressional trade battles starting with the 1990s fight over NAFTA. I did want to say, I, I just because it's in your bio, I mentioned in the office this morning during prep that when I was, I think when I was about, yeah, I was about 15 or 16 years old, and I went to my one of my first you know, major protests, and it was a World Bank IMF protest, I think, in 2000. And I remember I was probably like reading some of your articles in The Nation. And uh, so <laughs> it's cool to be talking with you. <laughs> Thanks for being here. I was only 12 when I wrote those. So. No, I know. You were precocious. <laughs> you were known as they uh, called you the child prodigy of global trade critiques. I remember that. So now you're now. Yeah. I mean, I, it was embarrassing, actually, because I said, my God, she's 12 years old and five years older than her. And she's already uh, writing great critiques of the general agreement on trade and tariffs in the nation. <laughs> um, and now here we are with NAFTA getting renegotiated. And now here we are with NAFTA getting renegotiated. Can you give us a history of NAFTA before we get to the renegotiations. Where does this trade agreement come from? Where did it start? What was agreed to in the 90s? The short version of it is that NAFTA effectively hijacked the the concept of trade agreements and used that branding to implement a set of binding international rules that created a whole set of new rights and powers for corporations and limited government rights to regulate on a lot of things unrelated to trade. So when Senator Elizabeth Warren talks about corporate rigged trade agreements, that is precisely accurate Mm -hmm. in that prior to NAFTA, trade agreements dealt with cutting border taxes called tariffs, on physical goods that would cross borders, so an imported product. With NAFTA, the corporations who, under U.S. procedures, had a special insider role. There were more than 500 official corporate advisors to the NAFTA negotiations, and it was a closed-door process. Congress and the press and public were locked out. They effectively hijacked that process no one was paying a lot of attention to, border taxes, <laughs> fell asleep thinking about it, right, right. to insert a whole different agenda. So NAFTA became this incredibly elegant Trojan horse, where, for instance, the pharmaceutical industry inserted new monopolies, anti-competitive rules in a free trade agreement to give them protections against competition from generic medicines to keep drug prices high. Or the agribusiness industry stuck in rules that that got rid of the policies that had been in place for 50 years that said imported food had to meet U.S. standards, not anymore under NAFTA. And all of the companies that were looking to outsource production to exploit low wages in Mexico 
got a whole set of special investor protections and privileges that basically made it much less risky and cheaper to outsource jobs. Mm -hmm. And that whole package got sold as trade. And the results, sadly, have been even more devastating than the coalition of environmental and labor and family farm and consumer groups and progressive Democrats who fought NAFTA in the early 90s predicted. So can we just – we'll get back to specifically NAFTA in a second, but, I mean, this is also uh, part of a whole kind of broader set of global trade regimes that were particularly, you know, prevalent in the nineties. Like I'm thinking of, of GATT general agreement on trade and tariffs, but then also, um, very similar to, uh, the Obama administration pushing TPP. And I want to just put one other thing on the table just briefly, because your work, I think always showed this because you were and are so good at basically, yeah, I mean, translating technical things that seem really boring, but actually have a big impact on everybody's life. And there's this new scholarship from uh, Quinn Slobodian, uh, Slobodian, excuse me. And I've, I'm forgetting the name of his book, but he, his argument is basically that when we say, when we accept the neoliberal or laissez-faire idea that they're advocating for less government, less interference in the market, that's a fundamental misconception because all of these trade systems and all of these way the rules of the road of of things like the WTO are highly bureaucratic, highly technical, highly government involved. They're just written in a way that explicitly benefits, like you were just saying, the pharmaceutical industry. So, I'm wondering first. I mean, does that kind of make sense as a way of understanding the the thing, uh, the the broader thing, and then? Like, how do all these trade systems fit together? Is it really just like writing the rules of the road to benefit the corporate sector across the planet? That's, that's it. In fact, that, you know, Quinn's description of it is exactly right. It's not that the agreements are eliminating regulation and government interference. They are rather imposing right. one-size-fits-all a set of rules that explicitly privilege big corporations and stick it to working people, the environment, and frankly, undermine the principle and practice of democracy. Because trade agreements shouldn't be locking in the parameters of what permissible domestic policy is on access to affordable medicines, on the regulation of banks, on the inspection of food for safety. Those are issues we need to fight out in Congress, local issues about land use and zoning, like agreements like NAFTA, try and make sure that, for instance, a community can't limit uh, big box stores. I mean, why is any of that in a trade agreement that should be fought out at at city council with everyone who's going to live with the results involved? So the whole idea of basically hijacking the trade agreements was to create these Trojan horse instruments that would shift decision-making away from those who would be affected and lock in rules that privileged global corporations. And, you know, speaking of good books, Robert Kuttner, Bob Kuttner, has a new book out that talks specifically about the fundamental incompatibility of these kind of rules and democracy. It's called Can Democracy Survive Global Capitalism? And it sounds like it's a companion to Quinn's book. Right. Because he basically points out, yes, of course we should have trade rules. Trade can be good. But we have to extract all of this corporate protectionism from the trade agreements. And this is, by the way, to jump back now to the future, this is exactly where what progressive organizations and unions and Democrats in Congress are now fighting for with the NAFTA renegotiation differs with what Trump's vision is. Trump's worldview about this is these trade agreements are about other countries sticking it to the U.S. Mm -hmm. We were dumb in how we negotiated them, or other countries take advantage of us. That's not the deal. The deal is, actually, that these agreements were hatched in the U.S., after being marinated in corporate influence, and we, the U.S., helped impose these corporate rules on everyone. It wasn't we're the victim. We were one of the reasons these bad rules got hatched. And so the results that Trump spotlighted, very bad results, to appeal to voters in 
Wisconsin and Michigan and Ohio and Pennsylvania. Those are real results. But the reason those results are there is not because Mexico stuck it to us in NAFTA. It's because a bunch of big corporations, mainly in the U.S., but also in Canada and Mexico, got a set of rules that they like that have been a losing proposition for people in all three countries. So we just did a study with LACLA, the Labor Council for Latin American Advancement. Mm -hmm. That's on our website, tradewatch.org that presents the empirical data that shows actually the biggest victims, people most penalized by NAFTA, are working people in Mexico and Latino and African American workers in the U.S. U.S. workers have seen almost a million specific good manufacturing middle wage, middle class wage jobs certified by the U.S. government is outsourced to NAFTA under these special protections that promote outsourcing. Mexico, Canada have paid hundreds of millions of dollars to corporations who attack domestic policies using the outrageous NAFTA investor state tribunal system where corporations can extract taxpayer money attacking domestic health and environmental laws claiming they violate their new NAFTA investor rights. All of these outcomes are directly attributable to a set of rules that basically put corporate interests first. And so when Trump is renegotiating NAFTA, you know, his view of what the problem is, Mexico stuck it to us, is not related to what the actual problem is. Now, happily, the guy who is his lead negotiator is a guy who's worked with the unions for a very long time, and he actually managed to get some of the fixes exactly right. So we have this renegotiated NAFTA that was signed on November 30th, and part of it got fixed. So those investor state tribunals got largely whacked, which is amazing. That civil right. society should feel great about that. Can you explain that, what those are got... just briefly get into the investor state? Because those are, those are really big. Can you just give us a little bit of details on those in a minute and then explain where the renegotiation failed? You bet. So what I, what I want to just say before I explain investor state is the way okay. I would look at it right now is some important things got fixed. Things have progressively been banning forever. Some new bad stuff got added, new rights for big pharma to lock in high medicine prices. That has got to go. And then there's some really important unfinished business. There's some improvements on labor standards, but not enough, and they're not yet sufficiently enforceable. The environmental standards still need to be strengthened and made more enforceable. And right now, progressive members of Congress, organizations are all united, basically, thank goodness, because the Democrats now have a majority in the House, saying, hey, you want this agreement to pass? You've got to make the rest of the improvements. You've got to get rid of the big pharma stuff. You've got to add the labor and environmental enforcement and strengthening. And then there might be an agreement that could stop some of NAFTA's damage. The agreement you signed is not going to cut it. So ISDS, one of the things they did fix is this regime that was first hatched with NAFTA, because NAFTA really was the model for all of these other bad agreements, including TPP. TPP was like NAFTA on steroids. So at the heart of all of those agreements is this regime called investor state dispute settlement where multinational corporations are empowered to attack countries' domestic laws and attack them not in domestic courts but in front of tribunals of three corporate attorneys. And the corporate attorneys are allowed to order the government to pay unlimited amounts to be paid by us taxpayers for any domestic policy, law, regulation, court decision, government action that the corporations claim undermine the investor protections and rights they have in the agreement. And these three private sector attorneys who rotate between being the <clears throat> not really judges and suing governments for corporations, these guys rotate so incredible conflict of interest, and their decisions aren't appealable, and the sums they can make us pay are unlimited. So $392 million has been ordered paid in ISDS NAFTA attacks against zoning policies, water policies, timber policies, energy policies, toxic spans. 
And that system in the revised NAFTA is totally eliminated between the U.S. and Canada, which is a big deal because the sad story is the majority of the attacks have been U.S. corporations attacking Canada's superior environmental and health laws. So that's totally ended in in NAFTA 2.0. And then with respect to Mexico, the broad corporate rights that have been the basis for these attacks on environmental laws are eliminated. The claims that can be made are for what's called expropriation. If the government takes your property and doesn't pay you back, and there are limits on how much the damages can be. There's a new rule that says no rotating for the panel, the tribunalists and the people who sue governments. But most importantly, under this replacement for ISDS, the, the corporations have to go to domestic courts. They have to spend two and a half years in domestic courts and get a ruling from the highest court in the land or get no ruling before they can even start the process under the very limited claims available. That's huge progress. There's one loophole. The broad rights are preserved for the seven U.S. oil and gas companies that have nine existing contracts with Mexico's hydrocarbons authority. And that loophole, Democrats and progressives are fighting to get narrowed. But that was an important improvement that people have been fighting for forever. In contrast, you know, the TPP expanded ISDS. It covered... In TPP, it wasn't just the whole old bad system. It also allowed to tax some financial regulation policies. So that, that is a step, big step, big step in the right direction. Also, some horrible NAFTA rules that forced countries to export natural resources that they wanted to conserve was removed. Some actual trade rules that allowed a lot of products basically made in China to sneak through under the NAFTA, duty-free benefits were tightened up. That's important. An interesting new rule was added that for products to get the NAFTA benefits, a portion of an automobile's value has to be made by workers making $16 an hour or more. Mm -hmm. That's the first time that wage levels have been linked to market access. That's super important. Mm -hmm. Another big fix was a big problem on the original NAFTA of basically requiring trucks from Mexico and Canada that didn't meet U.S. environmental or safety standards. They had to be allowed on U.S. roads. That got removed. So now those safety standards and also the worker driver, the worker driver hour safety rules, all that stuff can be reapplied. So those are important improvements. The problem is that the environmental and labor improvements needed to get rid of, to at least lessen, the incentives to outsource jobs are not yet sufficient. And they added new monopoly rights for big pharma. Mm-hmm. So I want to get, yeah, we'll get those. I want to actually, before we get to that, what are specifically the new monopoly rights for big pharma? So here is what the agreement did. It has... It has rules that would guarantee for pharmaceutical corporations that basically forever, because trade agreements generally don't have termination periods, the new NAFTA does have a six-year review provision, which is important. Corporations hate it. There is a way that it can be sunset. It's not easy to use, but the current NAFTA goes on forever. And an improvement in the new agreement is there is this review and possible sunset. But basically, unless a country got out, there would be forever a requirement that all governments provide to pharmaceutical companies the exact policies now in place in the U.S. that cause the high prices. So, for instance, 10 years of what's called marketing exclusivity for what are called biologic medicines. Those are all the cutting-edge new drugs that are used to treat cancer, diabetes, a lot of autoimmune diseases, plus a bunch of vaccines. And these drugs now, in addition to their patents, which is a monopoly for 20 years, have these marketing exclusivities, which, which basically says even if you don't have a patent, you just can't sell this drug for 10 years as a generic. Mm-hmm. So that has led to prices for these kind of biologic medicines being hundreds of thousands of dollars a year per patient. Just totally, I mean, to put this in perspective, 
Biologics are a relatively small portion of total medicines, but they represent 70% of the growth in medicine price expenditures in the last five years. So they're, they're super expensive. That's got to change. Lots of legislation in Congress would whack back those exclusivity periods. Another thing the new NAFTA would lock in is what's called evergreening. These are a whole basket of different policies that pharmaceutical companies use to extend their actual patents behind 20 years. So that is, for instance, the new NAFTA requires governments to allow new 20-year patents on known chemicals, one that's already had a patent, if the company finds a new use. So like Viagra was originally a hair growth medicine. And this other effect was reported. (laughs) So a second patent for the other use of Viagra besides growing hair could be registered for another 20 years. Or, for instance, by combining a patented drug with something else, you could get a new 20-year monopoly. That kind of stuff has to go. That means, right. you know, drug companies get more than 20 years of monopoly. So those things get locked in. So those are some of the things that have to come out. It's stuff Mexico and Canada didn't want. The U.S. negotiators pushed that stuff, and now the Democrats in Congress are very unified saying, hey, whatever you think about trade, we're not going to sign an international agreement that takes away Congress's ability to make the changes necessary to bring down medicine prices. And um, and. Forgive me if I'm wrong, but I for when we think of what industry spends the most on lobbying in Washington, and we think of defense and oil companies, and obviously financial services and Silicon Valley. But if I understand correctly, it is pharma. Pharma has the most lobbyists or most money flowing to Congress. If I understand that correctly, so that's that a, is correct. Yeah. There's studies after studies that show that. But here is the one that's thing that's fight. happened. Yeah, that gives us the chance to get this fixed. Everyone in this country, Democrats, Republicans, has come into a state of rage about current medicine prices. Mm -hmm. And we saw Mm -hmm. a lot of Democrats, who are now the new majority in the House, elected on this issue. So as much as pharma has lots of money sloshing around Washington, there are also a lot of members of Congress who realize the public is, like, ready to come after them with pitchforks if they don't deal with this. And even the president has been screaming, the press has been in the last two weeks, screaming at his own advisors about, what are we doing to bring down medicine prices? (laughs) Well, the first thing they shouldn't do is lock in high prices. So this seems to be one, if we do the work, we can get this fixed. Absolutely. So, And I also, if you'll indulge me for a second, my comedic mind, when you talked about the other effect of Viagra, I thought of... uh, like a scene in Sopranos, but it would be like pharmaceutical <laughs> Sopranos. Like, hey, Tone, there's another effect. We can get a new, man- <laughs> we can get an extension uh-huh. on it. All right, um, now that I've indulged myself there for a second, so, so okay, and actually, I want to just put three things on the table, and and one of them will be a bit longer. So if we, I hope we can go in at least another couple of minutes, but just. First, briefly, I've just noticed, I mean, you've been calling this NAFTA 2.0, not, um, I don't even know what Trump has been calling it, but just to be really clear that the spin from the administration, that this is a totally new thing, is nonsense and wrong, and this is, with both its improvements and its and its actual worsenings, this is another version of NAFTA. This is not any type of reinvention, which, you know, Trump would have you believe. Yeah, it's a rebrand. He is trying to make the claim that he has totally replaced NAFTA. This is not the transformational replacement of the NAFTA model. It should be called NAFTA 2.0. The question and the test in the end is can we get the additional improvements made so that this agreement, its revised version, if in the end, can be a deal that can stop some of NAFTA's serious ongoing damage. So if this were a blank slate, like with TPP, where you either had a new agreement or you didn't have a new agreement, this agreement would not be something people would be fighting to make better necessarily. Mm-hmm. The difference is we got a NAFTA in place. Right. It's causing ongoing damage every damn week. Every week, more middle-class jobs are being outsourced. And here's the thing. We don't begrudge people in Mexico a good job. The problem is NAFTA is like a machine that turns middle-class jobs into sweatshop jobs. Right. Because jobs in Mexico 
pay a buck fifty to two dollars an hour for jobs that folks in the U.S. were getting paid fifteen, twenty, twenty-five dollars an hour for. And by the way, it's not just manufacturing. I mean, the newest thing is like AT and T is putting a big call center. Right. No, Verizon. Right. It's Verizon is putting a big call center into Mexico City, five thousand seats. And they are recruiting people at the airport who've been unjustly deported, knowing that they found people who speak English and they can pay them a buck fifty an hour to do the same job that if they were in the U.S. they'd be represented by a union, CWA, communication workers, and have a good middle class wage, benefits, etc. So it's a race to the bottom in wages. So that the reason, for instance, you know, the, the last leftover thing besides getting the farm stuff out. The environmental and labor standards need to be improved and made subject to swift and certain enforcement. And here's why. Real wages in Mexico are down. The median real wage is down 3% since NAFTA went into effect. And it was not a survivable wage that could feed a family. You could work, two people could work full time and not be able to support a family of four under the, the wages that were available before NAFTA. And now it's down. So just to put this in perspective, Mexican manufacturing wages are now 40% cheaper than in China. So for people in Mexico, getting the rules strengthened so they can have a real union, have higher wages, is a moral imperative. So when a lot of people say, how can you stomach trying to work to improve and maybe pass a trade agreement with this administration? The answer is, if you're a progressive person and you look at this new NAFTA draft, there is an annex in there that says Mexico agrees to provide secret ballot votes on union contracts and in four years to replace all of the fake, what are called protection union contracts. Those are contracts not allowed under Mexican labor law, where before a worker even gets hired, a branch of the old political party, the PRI, that calls itself a union, goes into the boss, For a certain amount of money, they make a contract. It protects the corporation. They register it under law because the Mexican Constitution requires union representation. Now there's a contract. The workers didn't approve it. They don't know about it. It's low wages. Workers come in, realize they have crap pay, do a strike, and they'll get fired for violating the contract that they never approved. And if they try and organize an independent union, they get fired and go to jail for violating labor law. So if we could really make those rules in the revised agreements that for the first time would let Mexican workers have independent unions and really fight to raise their wages, that is something we have to try to get to become reality, as well as other improvements that are in that agreement. That is something that is not just critical to stop the pull that Mexico's low wages have to outsource U.S. jobs. But that's also really important to making the standard of living in Mexico, the wages paid there, decent. Otherwise, again, middle-class jobs, whether they are being filled by Mexican or U.S. workers, turn into sweatshop jobs. And it's just not acceptable, that race to the bottom. 100 percent. And and this is really, really crucial because, you know, in the press coverage, particularly in 2016, the lazy and I will say corporate media narrative was, well, I mean, they drew a lot of false equivalencies between Sanders and Trump, but very specifically on trade, the way they would say Trump's sort of like general, just kind of xenophobic bellicosity and all these conspiracies and nonsense about somehow, Trump, you know, Mexico getting one over on the United States versus Bernie Sanders you know, principled call to have trade agreements that reflected a broad set of needs, labor, the environment, living standards, and allowing for, you know, the obvious trade that comes to people's minds. I mean, that, that's a big problem. If you say trade, these people want you to think like, oh, right, this means like, you know, you get you get your coffee from Colombia and you get to watch a movie, you know, your favorite Kung Fu movie from Hong Kong and Whatever, that's trade. And like what they mean is, as you've been outlining, is actually very technical, very bureaucratic agreements written to benefit corporations, tra- any corporation. So it's real. I love that you you connect those dots, not only because it's right on the policy, but because we actually we need to really debunk the lazy, discredited media narrative um, that there's any equivalency 
between a left critique of things like NAFTA and the, the right wing xenophobia. But of course, at the same time, no doubt, if we can get a better NAFTA with whoever's in there, we absolutely should, 100%. And, I, and that leads me to my, my last kind of general question I want to ask you. It seems to me that every single time there's a new trade agreement that a Democrat pushes. Um, I looked into Clinton, uh, and I obviously you know, was uh, here for Obama. They always say that whatever fill-in-the-blank new trade agreement is has unparalleled side protections for the environment, labor, and public health. And it's going to do great things for, you know, union workers in Indonesia and to protect the world's uh, oceans if it's TPP or if it's uh, NAFTA. Uh, you know, uh, Bill Clinton talked about uh, putting rigorous side agreements on. And we know from the merits and the substance of these uh, of these agreements, uh, both in the written form with TPP, which thankfully hasn't been implemented, as well as what we've been living through at NAFTA, thanks to analysis and reporting from people like you that you know, this is just simply not true. But it's highly technical. It's hard to figure out. And so my question for you, and and this will be, you know, definitely geared towards Democrats or people likely to be voting in a Democratic primary, which I'm sure is over like 95 percent of this audience. How do we get really specific in the sense that we could say, look, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, yes, they're probably, I mean, Bernie definitely is. Warren seems to definitely be. She has a shorter career, obviously, but I think you could confidently assume they're on the right side of these issues. If Sherrod Brown gets in, he's definitely on the right side of these issues. And then, uh, you know, pretty clearly Joe Biden's consistently been on the wrong side of these issues. But for candidates, and frankly, I guess this is for any of them, they're all going to say that these that, oh, I'll only support agreements that have great green and labor uh, standards. But because it's so technical and because Democrats always say that, what are the kind of specific questions that, as an example, if you're at a candidate town hall or something like that, to really narrow down what a candidate actually means when they talk about their stance towards trade so we can get highly specific and know where people are actually coming from on these agreements? Yep. Very good question. So the first of all, one of I think the the best sort of overviews of what is a progressive set of rules of the road for a trade agreement, and this is not to toot my own horn, but it's something that I wrote with Jared Bernstein, mm -hmm. who after after he had been a couple years after he was Vice President Biden's chief economist, mm -hmm. he and I were having a conversation about you know what would be the thing we should be calling for? Let's, let's help summarize that. So it's called the New Progressive Rules of the Road on Trade, and it's on Jared's blog. So if you look up Jared Bernstein, you can see this New Rules of the Road, Progressive Rules of the Road for Trade. And that lays out in, you know, 15 pages what it looks like. The trigger questions, folks can actually get talking points <laughs> sent to them with those questions specific to NAFTA, the renegotiation, but broader, if you go to our action page, which is www.replacenafta.org, there's a sign-up form where it says, do you want to be part of the team that makes sure we replace the corporate rig trade agreements? And we actually are helping people, lots of people did it in this last election cycle, go to town hall meetings and ask the right questions. That's www.replacenafta.org. Sign up on the action list because literally you can sign up and then you can say what you want. You can say, I want to know what questions to ask. The, the short answer is the things that, that can differentiate clearly between who is for real and who is not is a question about investor state dispute settlement. Mm. Will you oppose any trade agreement? Or if you're president, will you ensure every future U.S. trade agreement does not have investor state dispute settlement. That's a bright line question about corporate power. Same thing. If you are elected president, will you ensure that our trade agreements do not contain any new monopolies and powers for big pharma? Bright line question. You either have the patent rules or you don't have the patent rules. On environment and labor specifically, the question to ask is, will you ensure that environmental and labor standards, in the way it's written as tough environmental and labor standards, can be triggered automatically 
so that enforcement is swift and certain? And that sounds like a complicated question. All it means is the difference between having standards that can be actually enforced by unions or the public bringing up a problem versus having to rely on trade officials to start the process. Mm -hmm. And there are a bunch of commercial rights and trade agreements that can be triggered. For instance, here, here's what this means practically. A, we have these intellectual property rules and trade agreements, and domestic law gets changed so that if a copyrighted uh, product, if a, a pirated you know, CD comes in, if a pirated uh, a fake knockoff of a movie comes in, there can be, that can be stopped at the border. And if a product comes in that is supposed to be made in Germany, but really it's from China, and it's, it's a lie, the way the customs forms are filled out is a lie, that can be stopped at the border. What we need is a system where products that don't meet a trade agreement's environmental and labor standards can automatically be stopped at the border, mm -hmm. that you don't need to go through a whole special rigmarole to try and enforce those standards. That's the same level of enforcement like intellectual property rules or other trade rules. That's, that's what it boils down to. But how you ask the question, again, sign off at www.replacenafta.org, and we will get you the specific talking points. Awesome. And, of course, we will link to all of that on our homepage at Majority.fm. Lori Wallach, you are so important, uh, and this work is so important. I really appreciate it. I hope everybody will follow up on all of those fronts. And if you are participating in this primary in any capacity, get really, really specific because these trade agreements are, I mean, it's one of those things. It's definitely a 1% versus 99% issue. Unless you're on a boardroom, uh, for, you know, uh, Pfizer or something. These agreements are not good for you. <laughs> They're bad. Uh, so Lori Wallach, she's the director of Public Citizens Global Trade Watch. Lori, thank you so much for doing this. I appreciate your time. A thousand thanks to you. And folks, if you feel you want to get more comfortable with the details, the other place to go is tradewatch.org. And we literally have, as a, as a report card, what the demand was from progressives, and then how the agreement measures up. And it's in language for civilians. You do not need to speak NAFTA ease. So please get involved, and thank you so much for doing the show. I oh, appreciate it. Uh, they are really, appreci they are really um, counting on you being afraid of speaking NAFTA ease. Um, it's a whole other, you know, I ta I've talked a little bit about Paulo Freire, who wrote Pedagogy of the Oppressed. He was this radical Brazilian educator. And if I recall correctly, he would teach people literacy through learning how to read the newspaper because he would join together basically like the practical skill of reading with like what are the stakes were in their lives in terms of the politics of their moment. And uh, there's just so much garbage policy and garbage ideas that get shuffled through techno speak to try to intimidate you out of following your common sense, which most people really have. I mean, I've used this example a million times, but it's a good example of that uh, Wall Street guy that I'm like, you know, literally running at the treadmill and he's a loud mouth, whatever, nice guy. We're talking, we get in some argument about derivatives or something. And I used the Matt tight. He was and he was doing all this like, well, you know, I mean, look, you're a smart guy, but, you know, I've worked at blah, 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 blah for 10 years or whatever. And I finally gave him, I think, probably a Taibi example of like, yeah, dude, I, I look, yeah, sure. I don't have an MBA. I don't work on Wall Street. But it sounds to me that the thing you're talking about is like the scene in Goodfellas where they torch the restaurant and collect the insurance money. And I'm saying that that should be regulated or eliminated. And he's just kind of like, yeah, that is what it is. It's like, right. So don't try to like come at me with your gobbledygook. Uh, and it's the same with NAFTA. And somebody like Lori Wallach is so smart and such a clear communicator, she breaks it down. So I would just say, yeah, follow all of her work on global trade. And as uh, as the uh, hysterical professor from Canada would say, be very precise with the candidates about it. Um, all right, folks, we are going to go to the fun half momentarily. Uh, and it's going to be a very exciting fun half frankly. Um, 
Become a member of the Majority Report today. Majority.fm slash become a member. That's how this show happens. That's how you have in-depth conversations and discover the vital work of people like Lori Wallach. You can do that by going to the Majority Report homepage, clicking on membership or support, and getting yourself a membership. Do it today. Justcoffee.coop. Of course, today's sponsor, if it's relevant to you, check it out. Get the deal. Subscribe on YouTube. All the rest of the ways that you can help keep this show growing and humming. Of course, keep the Michael Brooks Show growing and humming. We are 50 patrons away from our 2,000 patron goal. Let's get there. Help sustain, obviously, and expand our work. uh, And also will lead us to do this food bucket challenge, which I thought was a much better idea when we were about 700 people away from the next goal. Uh, But it will be fun. Of course, tonight we're live. Uh, Usually we're on Tuesdays, but because of... Frankly, because of uh, the government shutdown has affected our workflow. And it's going to affect our, because we're going to do Thursday again next week, because we're doing majority report coverage of Trump's Third of the Union address. Don't sound too excited. Let me just say preemptively <coughs> I'm sick. No, I'm just playing. I'll be there. Uh, I will be there on Tuesday night. But tonight we are live. So we're also starting an hour earlier because we need to do the final bit of preparation for our first TMBS live show tomorrow night at the Bell House. So we're starting earlier at 6 p.m. We are obviously got a lot to cover on Venezuela. And then the great Bill Fletcher Jr. joins us. We're talking about uprisings that are happening right now in Zimbabwe and the Sudan that circle around labor, austerity, global trade regimes. And then we're going to talk about the legacy of the revolutionary Amishal Cabral uh, and Africa in the leftist imagination. Bill Fletcher Jr. is a former president of Trans-Africa Forum and one of the most important people uh, in the game today, kind of a mentor to me, uh, live tonight, 6 p.m., the Michael Brooks Show YouTube channel. And, of course, become a patron and get the whole thing, two-to-one content, at Patreon, that is two more post-game and illicit histories, plus the full main long show, which is quite an endeavor in and of itself, at patreon.com slash tmbs, patreon.com slash tmbs. I'm not sure uh, about the ticket situation, but there's a link, so go check it out on the homepage and see. We look forward to seeing everybody there. Jamie, what's going on? Yeah, so this week on the Antifada, we speak with the Always on point, Leslie Lee the Third. I like Struggle Leslie session. Lee the Third a lot. He, he's a good guy. I, he's I, funny and smart. He's so funny and he's so smart. And I would call him a hater, except he really likes the things that he likes as well. He's got great taste and he's like really funny and mean about stuff that's bad and like just really likes genuinely the things that are good. So, like comic books and Nation of Islam Obama. Those sure. Are, no, he he is a big fan of Nation of Islam. Uh, as well as the Purge movies, uh, which I had slept on for way too long. So we talk with him about uh, the Purge series as well as The Handmaid's Tale. We finally talk about The Handmaid's Tale. I know people have been asking me when we're going to do that. Is that show still on? Uh, I mean, I'm not going to watch it anymore. I think I've seen enough. But uh, it's it's coming back, apparently. And we we talk about it sort of in the context of what it means to like resisted slips and all the horrible memes people have made based on it like this one that i think you're gonna find funny uh it's a picture of the handmaids dressed up in their you know like Mm -hmm. rape slave garb and one of them's like oh i know but i just didn't like hillary (laughs) wow this is a jill Jill stein shot huh yeah so (laughs) (laughs) that's pretty funny it's like See, Getting this is what happens when you don't them. vote for Hillary. Now you're living under theocratic fascism. It's so hard to pull off the dialectic of disputing dumb moralism voting, which is voting for Jill Stein in a swing state, with, on the other hand, this like resistance like, well, you voted the wrong way, and Hillary Clinton was a perfectly good candidate, and there was no problem in society, and Obama and her and everybody would just have Amazon Prime, but you wrecked it. And yeah. there was never any problem before until November 2016. Yeah. So, so, I mean, yeah. So presumably you guys knocked that dialectic out of the park. I, I like to think so. 
Uh, Leslie Lee is he's so good. Yes. He's good, folks. He is very good. And uh, I think this weekend, Sean and I are going to be on some sort of Twitch thing that the Chapo folks are doing for the Super Bowl. What? What? I heard a. Oh, I thought I heard something. I okay. heard an exclamation behind me. But yeah, it's uh, it's gonna be uh, weird, probably. It sounds weird, Matt. House of the Seven Gables. Uh, we unpack uh, w- what might be of interest to this audience of nerds. We unpack a <laughs> reference. Look at Matt uh, just going in on the audience. Uh, a reference Hawthorne makes to Charles Fourier, who was a French utopian socialist, a pre-Marx uh, socialist. So. Mm. And Hawthorne uh, actually name drops him in the House of Seven Gables, and we go into that. Nice. Um... He's going to come on later in the fun half to visit us on camera for a couple of minutes. But I should say the infamous Jeff from Georgia is visiting us. He's in town. And so I'll take this opportunity to say to go to, to uh, patreon.com. Sla- is it slash dissident peasant? Right. And check out his work over there in the plug section of the show. He's going to t- he's he's chomping at the bit. Um, all right, folks. See you in the fun half. Jamie and I may have a disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right to mock them on YouTube.